Hi, good evening and welcome to our 10th KOL webinar, coming live this evening from our Manchester office and what has been a particularly hot day here in the UK. We are delighted to be joined this evening by Ollie Chilcott. If uh, Ollie would like to say hello. Hi. Uh... Hi, Ollie. Uh, Ollie will take us through spinal fracture management from a physio and bracing perspective. Uh, we will then go through the features of the MAMI Select, followed by a fitting. Uh, we will also go and do the same for the MAMI TLSO. Uh, for those who joined last week, uh, we are able to do that now by various camera, camera angles that we have in the office. Uh, so we have the main camera here where we'll be doing our presentations from. Uh, we then have table cam, which you move over to, you'll see Giles leaning. Um, Giles is able to do some uh, in-depth uh, product demonstrations with the table uh, cam with a top-down view. Uh, we also have a new camera angle this evening, which is our treatment camera, uh, where Giles will be able to do a fitting uh, of the Mami J Select uh, to a mannequin for the Mami J Select, and then we'll be fitting the TLS over to myself later. We have uh, a top-down view um, to give you a good understanding of the product, and also a side view as well um, to give you really a good uh, understanding of the product and how it's fitted. Uh, we will then, at the end of the evening, go to the fitting area at the back of the room, uh, where Giles will be able to go through the, uh, the features and benefits of the TLS store, which will then be fitted to myself. Uh, so thanks, Giles. Um, so just to go through, as we always do, a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, so do use the Q&A function at the bottom. Uh, we like to make these sessions as interactive as possible. Uh, so please do put any questions you have there, and Giles will be manning that function throughout the evening. We also have a chat function. As all our webinars is recorded, uh, this one will be posted onto our Ross Academy YouTube channel uh, by the end of the week. You can also view our other um, previous nine KOI webinars uh, on that site. Uh, you will receive an e-certificate uh, for attendance. Um, it's got pretty good at this, but it might go into your junk uh, folder. So please do save as a PDF. Uh, and we'll also send up some follow-up questionnaires and some feedback forms. So please do take the time to fill them in uh, on any topics you would like us to explore, but also how you feel we may be able to improve uh, these sessions that we are delivering. Um, so just to uh, introduce Ollie for this evening, uh, Ollie Chilcott is currently Neurosciences Therapy Lead from University Hostels in Coventry in Warwickshire. He originally qualified in 2008, then worked at King's College Hospital in London with a secondment to the Midlands Centre for Spinal Cord Injuries until his move to Coventry two and a half years ago. Keen to progress his specialist interest in spines and SCI, uh, he will be, in the coming weeks, moving to a new role, becoming Neuro Rehabilitation Case Manager for the Midlands and East for NHS England. Um, so congratulations on the new role, Ollie. Uh, one of his primary focuses in this new role will be the continual development of spinal pathways in that region. Uh, so thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, please do make it as interactive as possible. Uh, and at that point, I shall pass over to Ollie, who will start his presentation. Thank you. So, just thinking what I wanted to get out of this um, presentation out today, I was thinking of sort of the key things from what I can, I can offer would be looking at uh, physio considerations, what we think about embrace management, spinal fractures, sort of some of the patients sort of handling key points that we look at, and then the practicalities that we've faced over the last few months and sort of also some of our experiences as a major trauma centre and what we've sort of encountered and some of the challenges and how we've tried to overcome some of those. Um, the therapy principles of application, so the things we need to think about in terms of in the acute stage and looking sort of through the longer term pathways. And then we've tried to bring in a couple of case studies to look at um, where we can sort of work with this patient group and really benefit this patient group. So over to Josh for a quick poll. Um, so we, again, as we always do, um, just wanted to know a little bit uh, about your role. Um, so this is just helpful for, for Ollie to, to know uh, about, about who's out there and who he's talking to. Um, so if you just uh, fill that out, just, just a note, if you're joining from a browser, this may or may not pop up depending on which browser you use. Um, so I'll leave that up for another 10 seconds or so. We're at about nearly 80% um, and I'll end that one there and then share that. So we have 2% uh, uh, consults of doctors, 70% uh, physios, 18% uh, uh, orthotists, 5% OTs, and then 5% other. Cool, thank you. So thinking first of all, um, from a bracing perspective and sort of from a spinal trauma perspective, I've pulled from the GERF report, um, so the getting it right first time report. So just thinking the, the key points really, initial management of 
of traumatic spinal cord or traumatic sort of uh, or any form of sort of spinal fractures, swift diagnosis and stabilization, be it surgical, be it sort of through fixation, through a brace or anything else like that, um, to prevent for dis disability. So that's sort of one of the key principles of the way we think about working and going from there. Um, the evidence with spinal fractures, there's not loads out there, so it sort of tends to link it a little bit more with spinal cord injuries and other factors that little i've not sort of noticed a lot in sort of isolated spinal fractures so thinking then about early considerations that we encounter sort of in the really acute setting the three primary aspects we look at are early surgical fixation and then we would mobilize up as quickly as possible plus or minus a, a brace so what we then tend to think about then is that's when we're in early conversations with the consultants of a sort of the extent of the fractures, B, sort of the quality, how the consultant feels the um, fixation has gone, and is he happy that it doesn't, does or doesn't need a brace, and then we're sort of going from there, and then we'll be liaising with orthotists, or there's an acute, certainly at UHW, we have a period, period of acute bed rest, where the consultants might, if it's a sort of a particularly complex fracture or there's something that's sort of extenuating on it, so they might be looking at going to spinal, spinal MDT, to make a decision as a sort of as a group and then we might be looking either at a fixation plus or minus a brace or we're mobilizing plus or minus a brace thinking about the stability of the fracture are they happy it's stable can we get up and mobilize and thinking about the healing factors so age sort of other comorbidities that might be limiting it and then we have sort of some of the easier ones sort of straight if we look at the fracture the consultant's happy it's straight into a brace and then mobilize and obviously the final decision is the fracture is very stable and we don't need to brace it at all. Um, so thinking then roles of the brace, obviously the brace is there to stabilize sort of immobilize the fracture and what you tend to find with that is it stabilizes the vertebra sort of a couple of uh, vertebra above and a couple below which is why when we're thinking about what brace we use it's sort of really key to know what levels it stabilizes because if we're going at the upper or lower extremes of it we might have concerns that if it's a particularly unstable or a particularly nasty fracture is the brace going to stabilize well enough or do we need to look at other options um, so that's sort of one of the key points that we look at um, there's a role for the brace sort of often we'll do it just for purely for pain management so the fracture might be fairly stable but is it very painful in which case we found quite a lot of benefit in uh, providing a brace to sort of help with man pain management although the brace itself is uncomfortable we find a lot of people have improved sort of function going from there um, one of the slightly more sort of challenging areas, um, we'll often be asked to provide a brace to minimise the development of deformities further down the line, so minimise kyphosis, lordosis, things like that. However, the evidence around that sort of, uh, Karimi in 2015 reviewed some of the literature for thoracolumbar braces and found that sort of kyphotic angle, vertical height and stuff like that wasn't really affected by braces. Um, but I think that's down to sort of individual consultant choice and decision making. Um, the other aspect we need to think about the failure of braces is Hitchin in 2016 showed that uh, pain limiting mobility was one of the biggest factors for failure of conservative management. And we find that as therapists, often if we're getting patients that are really early on braced, um, then actually if the pain is the big limiting factor, will be linking in with the consultants further down the line to sort of say actually this brace isn't managing our pain and it's causing us sort of major issues. At that point we might look at different braces or will the surgeon will sort of or the consultant will want to consider surgery and go from there. So our role as physios and we've got sort of multiple different aspects we're looking at and it depends on is the patient coming through with sort of a multiple polytrauma picture or are they coming through with isolated spinal fractures or are they coming through with element of spinal cord injury within that so we will often look at consideration for sort of other injuries as physios and rib fractures are one of the big sort of more complex aspects that we need to really take in sort of into consideration and um, do they have a traumatic brain injury or are they polytrauma because Someone with a traumatic brain injury might have significant aspects of confusion, disorientation. Do they have capacity? Do they have the understanding as to why they're managing the brace? And that is one of our more challenging sort of patient groups to brace. Um, and a lot of that is done in 
we'll sort of start to work as an MDT on that, but that might be a cohort where we have really early conversations with our consultants and saying, actually, this patient's going to be non-compliant with the brace at the moment due to all of these other factors. Can we, um, do we need to consider surgery? Or we might discuss early with our neuro rehab consultant where we're looking at um, what meds they're on, can we manage them sort of through medication in terms of reducing delirium and other aspects. Um, so we will try and do a neuro assessment as early as possible as well, if we feel it's indicated. Um, obviously the American Spinal Injuries Association um, Asia form is the gold standard. At UHW, we usually ask the doctors to do it because they're in 24 seven. So as soon as the patient hits A&E, that can be done. Um, but if we need to do that, I, I will on occasion do them. At other trusts, I've done them more frequently. So I think that's just a trust specific decision in how you wanna look at that. Um, obviously we're one of the groups that, especially with these fractures, will be looking at getting people up and mobilizing them as early as uh, is safe. And that's, again, thinking back to pain management being one of the big reasons for failure of the brace. We need to make sure that we are sort of hot on that and really sort of um, managing them appropriately and going through techniques that will minimise their pain relief, making sure braces are fitted appropriately and doing the job we want them to do. We'll then link in sort of advice. I will link in with advice and exercises and keeping active. And we sort of talk about progressing their exercise load and just gradually listening to their body and building things up as they'll go. Um, at UH, we do a lot of work in sort of teaching with the family and patient on the brace management. So depending on your consultant, depending on the decision and the stability of the fractures and several other factors, um, depends on how the brace is going to be fitted and um, how it, who, who is fitting it. So I've fitted braces in A&E and discharged people home from A&E um, fitting it themselves and we've gone to the point where because of the stability of the fracture but the comorbidities around the patient we've not been able to surgically fix them so we've had to brace them but with osteoporotic spine with all sorts of other factors they've still needed potentially alignment roll or log roll and that gets very complicated sort of further down the line so we have just sort of started to touch on discharge planning that's one of the sort of our key aspects beginning as early as possible um, we've noticed at UHW we um, have had a lot of issues with, or historically we've had a lot of challenges with collar management. So we've developed a YouTube collar care video that Giles has kindly put the link to, um, which we can then signpost patients and family to, um, as well as providing teaching on the ward. We've also developed um, multiple leaflets on collar care depending on and um, the other aspects for the patient in terms of if they're really confused or disorientated, there's a leaflet for that. Um, and if they can fit it sort of with two people or with one person. We, across the hospital, obviously being at the neurosciences therapy team, collars and braces still tend to end up across the whole of the hospital, especially if they're not coming under neurosurgery for management. So we'll provide um, a bit of outreach support and ward teaching sort of across the wider the rest of the hospital and then we link in with outpatient follow-up and support especially if they're coming to sort of certain outpatient areas that aren't familiar with um, brace management and things like that we'll link in to offer and provide further support um, i always bang on about this pressure area management is sort of it is everyone's concern obviously the big polytrauma patients that will come up come through they'll often end up being, going to critical care they might be collared and for sustained periods of time and they're not we're not able to clear the spine as early as we would like or they have a fracture but they're integrated ventilated paralyzed sedated while we manage their sort of more acute injuries so this is something that we really need to be hot on and also worst case scenario a spinal cord injured patient who develops significant pressure sores they can spend months and months and months on bed rest increasing the risk of significant secondary complications um, and shortening of muscle groups and all sorts of other aspects which will feed into their spinal cord injury rehab and really limit their ongoing potential. So we really need to be hot on making sure A, that we're bracing appropriately, but also that we are managing their pressure areas. Um, so we at UHCW tend to prefer not to routinely put things between the collar and the skin. I quite frequently see different bits of padding and stuff. Um, but we try to avoid that as much as we can. 
because actually it can be a big risk factor because it's changing the pressure points. Um, with braces, we tend to say only to have a cotton shirt between the skin and the brace. Obviously with a TSA with lower braces, we wouldn't have them on usually in bed. In bed. Um, and we'll say to any patients when they're at home to take them off while they're in bed, just to be warm when sitting up and mobilizing. Um, one of the factors we look at if we're really worrying with pressure areas is can we alter the pressure points without affecting the brace integrity? So can we sort of change and stabilize and support? Or do we need to look at different braces and collars? Um, in the acute phase, I usually find more pressure source because the brace is fitted poorly or the collar is fitted poorly or it's the wrong collar and brace fitted in the short term because then you get sort of rubbing points and lots of different pressure areas. So we've done a lot of work um, at USW and this is where we've had a lot of support from Osso in terms of they provided a lot of teaching and they've quite happily come in and we've done loads of work with the nurses through critical care and all the way up um, to manage this cohort and to try and get our braces as well fitted as possible. The other aspect we tend to say for patients that are being log rolled is can we align the side lie which is just have them slightly on their side with some uh, pillows just all in alignment so that we can just offload their pressure points. Um, but pressure area management for me is one of the real big areas that I will really try and pursue. I, when I graduated, I didn't really think that I'd be pursuing it as much as I can, but it's absolutely essential for ongoing rehab and it will really limit someone's potential if we don't get on top of it as early as possible. Um, Ollie, Ollie, sorry to interrupt. Um, there's a question from Jamal just with regard to, to patient compliance. If, if it's relatively poor and you're concerned about them taking the brace off, right? for example, if they have cognitive difficulties, how, how do you go about managing those sorts of situations? So if we've got really poor compliance, that's when I'll open up a really early conversation with the consultants and try and sort of say, or try and demonstrate the patient's lack of compliance. And then we're opening up, we're having a discussion around um, what is the purpose of the brace? Are we having the brace on just for comfort or for sort of pain management? In which case they're not, they're not usually too worried about people up and mobilizing. Or if they're really worried about the stability of the fracture, that's when as physios or as therapists and AHPs, we can start to say with the consultants, actually, I know you're really worried about the integrity sort of the fracture in the spinal column. The brace isn't working because of all the confusion in those aspects, so we need to then reconsider our options. And that's when we'll sort of start to push a little bit and say, this plan isn't working, we need to consider other options. Okay. Obviously, it's a lot easier for me in a major trauma centre to go and find the neurosurgeons and say, on day zero, this isn't working for people in district general hospitals and sort of other trauma units where you've sort of had the advice from the MTC. It's a little bit harder. But certainly within our region, that's where our major trauma team come in and they're always very happy to be contacted to sort of say, we've tried this plan, it's not working, what do we do? And I've sort of certainly escalated to certain consultants um, on behalf of community teams or sort of other hospitals to say, we're, we're, we're in a difficult situation, what do we do here? Yeah. Okay, that's, that's great, thank you. No problem. Um, so thinking, obviously just, Think about pressure management, thinking about keeping spinal alignment and moving on to log roll a little bit, thinking obviously aim to log roll, always immobilize the spine, maintain alignment, preserve spinal column integrity, uh, monitor pressure area damage, usually needs four people. So it's a really labor intensive process, um, which is manageable on our major trauma enhanced care unit on other wards, it's a little bit more complicated. So the earlier we get clearance and we can push for clearance for someone to be able to roll themselves or not needing a log roll, the better, or we would need to be keeping them on the enhanced care unit. Um, I always go into the how to because there's an element of this that really frustrate, frustrates us and we see it quite regularly on our wards and we see it elsewhere. You'll often be stood at the foot of a bed and you'll be having a conversation about how you're going to go in and what you're going to do. Obviously, we always, I always try and encourage people to remember the patient is staring at the ceiling. They're hearing you talking at the end of the bed, but they're staring at the ceiling and it's quite a terrifying procedure for them especially when someone comes in and says, oh, I haven't done this for years. And we're talking about their spinal cord and they've had all this waste at worst case scenario. So we usually try and gather if, before we go into the, into the room or into the bay, just to check everyone's happy with what they're doing. Everyone knows their roles, everyone knows their position. And it takes 30 seconds, but it can just exude that persona of calm and comfort for the patients. Um, 
always explain the procedure to the patient. And again, I would try and encourage you to be standing in front of the patient so they can see you, not sort of at the head of the bed, at the foot of the bed, or even if you are at the head of the bed and they're not looking at you, try and see that you can make eye contact with them and just talk them through what you're going to do. Because it's a really unnerving situation when we sort of just rock up and we do this. Um, so you always have the clinician holding the head, the shoulder, who is the team leader. And then you've got, um, well, we've got a picture in a minute to talk you through what second, third and fourth assistants would be doing. But then we'd always need more staff if we're delivering personal care, if we're checking skin or anything like that. Obviously, it, certainly at UH, if we've had the head, if the C-spine cleared, we don't need to do a head hold. Um, and that's sort of the way we tend to, tend to work. And then in terms of spinal log rolls, sort of managing like that, the mass hip guidance, guidance is really, really clear. And I'd encourage you, if you're not sure, to look it up because it talks you through every step, talks you through your hand positioning, talks you through what you're going to do. And it's freely accessible sort of online. So that's a really useful um, guide. And it's got all sorts of different, as you can see, it's got method one of log roll. It's got several other methods. This is the one we usually use at UH. But again, that's just, I think that's just our choice. So head holding. Obviously, again, similar aims. Um, always explain the procedure to the patient. I'll always repeat that bit. Um, and also think about why you're stabilizing the head. Are you stabilizing it because you're managing their chest from a respiratory physio perspective? Are you stabilizing it because you're wanting to roll the patient? Or are you stabilizing it to fit a collar? Because handling does, for us, certainly slightly change. Um, if you're fitting a collar and you have your hands down on someone's shoulders, um, then actually your hands are in the way of that collar fitting. And it makes it a lot harder for someone to be able to fit the collar. Whereas if you're... Um, stabilizing someone because you're worried they're going to cough and you're just holding the head then you're not managing those aspects so it's always sort of really key to think about what is why am i stabilizing here what is my role um, so yeah if you're putting the collar in i'd usually say stabilize at the head and we have hands either side of the head and we go from there but have i got the yeah the mask it guidance there so sort of, this talks about the application of the two-piece collar so this is the way i would usually look to handle and obviously, if I was stabilizing someone for a respiratory perspective, then my hand is usually on their shoulder, my hands are usually on their shoulders, and I'm stabilizing with my forearms around the head. But you always want to be confident that you've practiced that plenty of times and you know exactly how your hand is going to be and how you would respond. Um, so the collar application, always again, explain the procedure to the patient, talk through why you're changing the collar. The patient will always try and help you. No matter how much, how often you say it, the patient nearly always tries to help you. They'll lift their head, they'll roll their head, they'll try and do their best. So you want to be really clear with what you're doing, make sure the person doing the head hold knows exactly what they're doing. Um, we, the first time, we'll always apply it in supine. Um, just check whoever's doing the head hold has the bed height um, adjusted for them. Because if you're spending time trying to get the collar through the sheets and things like that, and they're bending over and hurting their back, it can be quite a torturous process. We would say sort of two to three staff fit in the collar, depending on local policy. Um, so that's one person head hold and then sort of two people fitting it. Because it will make it a lot easier to get these sheets and the blankets and stuff out of the way. Or removing collar block, collars or blocks. So if they've come in a pre-hospital collar or you're not happy with the current collar, make sure you're always doing your skin checks. And it doesn't take very long, but if you just do the personal, some bit of personal hygiene around the neck, it feels like bliss for the patient and it just reassures them. And the personal hygiene of the necks it gets really sweaty and really horrible and really uncomfortable for them. Also, if they're straight in out into A and E and things like that, you don't quite know what you're going to find because you might have bits of the road left over, bits of the accident left over. So it's sort of really key to just be ready that you might need to really clean the neck down first because if we're putting them into a brand new collar and we've got the road left on them and we've got other bits going on, actually we're going to immediately sort of soil those pads and just make it quite an uncomfortable experience and when we're thinking about pressure areas we're not sort of managing them as much as possible hair certainly in ladies can be sort of a bit of a challenge so you want to sort of make sure the hair is sort of always pulled back behind the patient if possible and um, ponytails make it really easy because then you can get it out of the way but not many patients will come into a &E having got their pony pet tail ready for you so it's just thinking about how you're going to do it think about your considerations and then just look at it. And if you're going into the ward to fit it, just sort of work from there. And then always check pressure points. Most of the collars 
are always slightly adjustable, so just make sure you're happy with the pressure points. Obviously, a collar needs to be tight. You've got to have the tightness for it to be doing its job, but you just want to check you're happy that it's not marking anywhere immediately. Otherwise, you might want to be speaking with your orthotists or with people more experienced with collars to check that they are um, fitted well and aligned properly. So yeah, we've talked about that. So the collar considerations that we primarily look at, the other injuries are sort of a key factor for us. So max facts, any maxillofacial injuries are can be really significant um, and you just really want to bear that in mind. We've had um, a real success recently where we tried multiple collars with a patient who had a significant laceration to, their, to her ear and whichever collar we were fitting was pressing, pressing on the laceration and sort of she degloved the section of her ear and sort of down the side of her neck. And she, it was intolerable because of the pain, but the Miami J Select gave us the extra adjustability where we could just put the collar on the side to a certain extent and it just fitted really well and she could tolerate it. So it's just bearing in mind what else is going on because while we've got to stabilize the neck, if we've got significant injuries around that area, then is a, a is a collar the right answer or do we need to stay in blocks? That's one of the other aspects that we would consider. Um, ideally blocks and sort of aren't, blocks aren't ideal, but it's sort of a needs must situation, certainly in the early stages and we'll have it in critical care as well. So we've talked a little bit about skin integrity, cleanliness, nutrition. What are they looking like? Obviously someone who's really malnourished, their skin integrity is gonna be potentially quite poor. So we just need to really bear that in mind. And that's where we look at sort of early refers to dietetics and things like that. Surgical sites and drains can make things difficult, but one of our big battles is tracheostomies where we're doing sort of long-term weans with patients and they've had it, they've got a trachea in. That can be a real challenge. Um, so it's really just exploring your different options of collars. The Select, again, has a much bigger sort of space for us to, for us to work with trachees, which is really nice, that's quite new. And that's probably the one where we have the most success at the moment. But depending on how the trachea was sighted, can sort of have significant issues and really sort of hamper the management of collars. The other aspects we have to bear in mind with our sort of traumatic brain injury patients coming in is intracranial pressures, central lines, things like that. Collars are sort of said to increase intracranial pressures. So we just need to bear that in mind. Certainly we'll look at not wearing a collar while we're in supine and we might look at blocks and things like that if we're worried, really worried about the ICPs. Central lines again, we need to think about the placement and that's where we might have a conversation with the intensivist and say, right, if, we're wearing, if we're needing to wear the collar, we need to think about actually placement of those lines and what can we do for skin integrity and just to manage the patient. But obviously central lines are in for a really key reason. So it's sort of a pragmatic conversation needs to be had around that. Um, the Ossian back we use regularly, it's pressure relieving back, one of the key aspects for our patients. Everyone going into critical care wearing a collar will usually get an Ossian back unless we think they're going to come out of the collar very, very quickly. Um, but we just need to bear in mind, and we sometimes have to remind people is that with the Ossian back, we can only sit patients up to 45 degrees before we have to change to a standard collar. So otherwise we lose sort of some of the integrity of that collar. Um, and there's a, sorry to interrupt Ollie, but there's a, a question from Michelle, just saying that you mentioned during the application of the collar, um, to fit the collar as seen, um, would you not aim to align the head and neck as part of the fraction management to ensure the collar is able to correct, uh, to fit correctly and stabilise as required? Um, yeah. so, uh, sorry, Giles. So I was just wondering your, your thoughts on that um, in terms of whether you, you correct that position or, or you um, yeah. fit, fit as seen in all instances. What, what are your so thoughts? As a, as a physio, we will always fit as, as seen. We won't realign. It's a conversation we'll have with the neurosurgeons. If the neurosurgeons are happy to realign or the consultants are happy to realign, then we will definitely work with them. But I think as a, as a therapist, I feel quite strongly that I, I need to make sure that every other aspect is safe. So if we are realigning, are we, and it's an unstable fracture, is something else, gonna, are we going to make this, are we going to make this patient into a spinal cord injury? Are we going to make things much worse? So I think that's, um, I will always fit as seen, and I will clearly document that, that the patient is slightly side flexed or they're rotated or something like that, but it's a conversation I will have with the consultant. So if I go and see the collar and 
they are or see the patient they're already slightly rotated and the, the doctors are there I will have that conversation because they might be happy enough to realign at that particular moment or they might say no we want to wait on the out, uh, outcome of further scans and go from there. Certainly things like uh, ankylosing spondylitis and, and conditions along those lines certainly are, are red flags for any sort of repositioning or whatever so yeah another, another thing to be aware of. Absolutely and we just really need to really think about the because we'll often see them really acutely so we need to think about the stability of those fractures further down the line um, usually the patients are self-correcting by that point because we've got, a collar doesn't provide complete immobilization if they wanted to completely immobilize they'd be looking at a halo so there's always an element of movement within collars and further down the line a patient will be um, normally self-aligning themselves so I suppose going into that in a little bit more detail if i am sort of treating four or five six weeks down the line or even a few weeks down the line and they've been wearing the collar for a while they will normally have self-aligned and moved enough within that but i um certainly in the acute stages i would be advocating that we fit our scene from my perspective and then have a conversation with consultants if we can okay great thank you so thinking about the tlso or lso sort of application again always talk to the patient through the procedure just so they know what you're going to do because putting the TSO on or the LSO it's going to go on tight to get a good fit to actually stabilize the vertebra we really need to get it on tight and we need a snug fit so we need to explain to them especially if they've got multiple other injuries and um, again we'll usually fit in supine first time round and um, I've normally got clearance from the doctors by then that we're not going to log roll. We'll either get them to roll themselves or we can just have one person to assist with rolling. But if they're really worried about the stability of the fracture and surgical operations aren't an option, then we might still be looking at log rolling. That is sort of very rare at that point though. Um, again, it's about sort of personal hygiene, skin checks, just check everything is in, in order. And I do a lot of teaching with the family because obviously the patient can't see what's going on. So you want to check that all their back and everything else is sort of uh, skin's integrity is good. And if it's not good, just make sure you're noticing it down um, and discussing it with the nursing staff in the acute setting. Because often these people, they will have come off a bike or they'll have fallen off a horse or there'll be other injuries. So we expect to have multiple different um, issues going on, but it's just about how we manage that and make sure that we're not, by applying the braces, we're not gonna have any sort of um, tissue viability concerns further down the line. Definitely not a red flag for us putting braces on because we need to mobilize these patients, we need to get them up, get them going, and lying in bed is only gonna make a lot of these issues worse. Um, one of the things we find really early on is the movement to brace from supine to sitting. The brace often does ride up a little bit from supine to sitting, so we are very clear with when we fit the brace, we'll get them up and sitting over the edge of the bed, and we then have a look again at how the brace, because we find with the TLSOs, the T piece, will often ride up, and I'm not in the business of trying to cause any further harm to my patients while they're, while we're doing that. So you might look like you've got a perfect fit and then it rides up and we need to consider why that would be. Because there could be multiple options. It could be due to sort of patient size. It could be due to have we got the fitness tight enough around sort of the stomach. Um, and also the shoulder straps. I've started, quite often I'll go in and see that people have really tightened the shoulder straps. And if you have them really tight, it will pull the brace up quite often. So you need to think about, look at those shoulder straps. They should obviously have a good pressure on them, but you need to make sure you've got a tightness around sort of the abdominal sections and then the shoulder straps aren't gonna be pulling the brace up. And can the brace be fitted in sitting in the longer term? A lot of our patients, the consultants would prefer it fitted in lying. So we need to consider that for discharge planning, but I've worked sort of previously where the predominant opinion was to fit the brace in sitting and that means the patient can put it on themselves more like a backpack um, and the consultants just have them to roll themselves and sit themselves over the edge of the bed does make things a lot easier for us but we need to consider all the all the different options and then again just checking pressure points making sure we're noting down on pressure points and going from there um, and there's a couple of questions with regards to uh, TLSOs. Um, uh, from one from Catherine, just saying, uh, in your trust, are there any guidelines with regards to using a TLSO versus an LSO? Do you have sort of cut-off levels where the consultants are no longer too happy to use an LSO? Um, so we, our consultants tend to prefer TLSOs all the time, um, and that's a personal preference. So 
my previous trust where we used LSAs, um, we went with, we used the Oster LSA at Kings and we went with Oster's sort of guidance on the levels of what was sort of appropriate for them to be fitted. Um, so that sort of, we usually go via the um, guidance from um, the companies that, that will make the braces. And because um, we've got to bear in mind that with these braces, when they, what, what they say that it will stabilize, to stabilize that level, it's got to sort of immobilize a couple of vertebrae above and below. So if we go too high and if we go out of the recommended ranges with LSOs and TLSOs, then we're potentially not, get, not getting as much stability as we would um, ideally like. However, that is a conversation I will have with the consultants because sometimes they'll very clearly say they want a collar or a brace when routinely we wouldn't necessarily say the collar or brace would stabilize that level, but it's taken on with a conversation with the consultants and we talk about just exactly what they're after with and what they're trying to do. And then we have braced and stabilized our side range levels. I think collar is most frequently where we, as a trust, will discuss with the consultants and we'll, I think, is it C2 to C5, Giles, that is most yeah, common? So, um, as as Oster as a manufacturer, we, our general recommendations are that the Miami J controls from C2 to C5. Uh, the Miami JTO, uh, which is a thoracic extension for the Miami J range, controls from C2 to T2. And then from a TLSO perspective, they're controlling from T7 down to L5 S1. And then the LSOs are controlling from L1 uh, down to L5 S1. And I think certainly with the Miami, with the Miamis, we will regularly stabilize, just fit a Miami on a C6 or C7 fracture. And that's a quick conversation with our consultant, but I think that's where we as, or the trust has taken on that sort of decision-making that actually we're happy with the level of stability we get. And we haven't noticed um, any issues with, with, with doing that. But that's, if we're stabilizing outside of that area, that's a conversation I'll have with the consultants or we'll discuss with the orthotists and it's thinking about the considerations of um, the type of fracture and the stability of the fracture as well that's going there or what other role they're thinking the brace might be wanting for. Um, so just thinking the big considerations we have for LSOs and TLSOs, ileostomies, colostomies are significant challenges for braces. In that stage, we early on will go to orthotics and say, actually, what have we got? Because we're, we can't sort of, um, adapt the brace well enough. What do you tend to do in that situation, Giles? Um, so it, it does obviously depend uh, on the positioning. Um, obviously, there's different changes that you can make to to braces in order to allow for those uh, those areas. So certainly, um, you can heat mold or, or even machine uh, the panels um, in in most spinal braces. Um, obviously, if you have to provide a complete aperture um, for for these types of uh, positions, that will involve um, some degree of modification of the soft goods. So often that will be done by a custom workshop um, in the orthotics department, for example. Um, it does depend on what you have available for you uh, in the hospital. So there's a, a variety of different things, but as you say, very much dependent on position, uh, size and sort of severity of, of, of what you're, you're trying to avoid. Yeah, and that's what we usually find is we're, that's a collaboration with orthotics for us quite early on. We identify it and then we'll pop the referral in because that sort of, we won't be adapting things like that. Um, so obviously your chest, chain, chest drains and central lines sort of fairly early on are, are challenges for us that we can usually work around or we need to think about what we're going to do. Um, pick lines, pegs can be challenges, but we've, we pop small towel over and we have no issues. We've not had any concerns with that in the past. And that's a standard way that we would work with at UHW. So obesity is one of our more challenging aspects, depending obviously on the size of the patient and depending on their sort of build. Um, if they have excess skin sort of falling out of the brace, um, then we found that it can prevent sitting in the past. So we've used a pelvic binder um, to sort of help sort of with their body shape a little bit and then we can brace over the pelvic binder. It's not ideal, it is very hot and sweaty I'm afraid um, and the patient doesn't really thank us for it, but it does mean we can get them up and get them mobile. Um, and then, yeah, just what we were talking about earlier, sort of with the T-piece, T-piece, um, 
and the sternal plate, when someone sort of sits up, it can be in a quite a different position than you think it would be. The amount of times we think we have a perfect position in lying and then we sit them up and the T piece is just a bit too high or not, we're not as happy with it, that can be a bit of a challenge. Um, elderly, smaller, kyphotic people, um, we usually go to a slightly, or we usually look at slightly different braces because we need to consider their body shape. So something that's really fixed and rigid is quite difficult. Um, so that's something that we take on fairly early on and we'll look at. Um, so as a trust, we have several different braces that as therapists we're trained to fit and then we'll try and sort of see if we've got something that we think um, will manage that. Otherwise we'll be going to orthotics. Our challenge with um, that is obviously normally we have to order stuff in, whereas we can fit the minute we're asked to fit. Um, so it's just sort of, we try and sort of cater for everything, but we can find people with significant kyphases and things like that it can be a bit more challenging. Um, very slight people um, can be a bit more of a challenge as well. So we just need to make sure we're sort of catering to that and we're really encountering that. Because we have had some slight, some people where no matter which brace we had, it, it was sort of a bit too small. So that's, again, conversations with the orthotists early on and seeing what they can adapt and what they can do. Um, as I said earlier, we always recommend a cotton shirt underneath. Um, we usually say nothing silky because that sort of rumples up and that can cause some skin challenges. And um, we've talked about over tightening of shoulder straps can pull the brace up. Um, brace care is a big aspect for us. And that's something we think about in sitting or lying. We will never, or we very, very rarely said that um, patients can shower with braces because we only ever give one brace out. We don't want it to get wet. We don't want to ruin the integrity of it. Um, so we usually will either say, um, you can sit on a perching stool, do your legs, do your lower half, and then either in bed, you need it's effectively a bed wash for your, your top half. Um, and brace care, just making sure someone is present to check back and check skin and things like that. We have a bit of a challenge, obviously, for people that live alone, um, but that's where certainly within our local uh, region, we've got a care agency that we've worked very clear, closely with in the past. And if we have people that we're discharging with braces, that's the care agency we will use because they can manage braces, they can fit braces, and they know what they're doing in terms of skin integrity and going from there. So we're quite fortunate. Other trusts have worked out we've not had that, um, but that's sort of a real benefit for us. And then seeing patients further down in clinic, weight loss of patient can be quite significant. Obviously, if they're in something with the, they're in the brace, they've had a significant injury, diet is going to change, appetite changes, they don't want to eat big meals while they're having everything squeezed in the brace so they do come in a bit further down the line having lost significant weight and the brace that we fitted potentially is no longer appropriate so we usually what well, we do a lot of teaching with the families we've got leaflets that we'll hand out and then we encourage them to get in touch with surgical appliances early on and if they do come into clinic we have popped into clinic beforehand just to adjust or to replace as required so We've got a bit of a poll. So this is uh, basically looking at how, how confident are you uh, in managing patients with spinal trauma? So it's just to give Ollie uh, a bit of an idea uh, about the audience because he's going to go into some case studies in a little bit. Um, so I'll leave this up for a little bit longer. We've got about 50% of the people have answered. Um, so we're up to about 70%. Leave it on for a, a few more seconds. It's a pretty even spread, I can see. Um, so I'm going to stop that there and then share it. So we have 22% uh, not very confident, 37% uh, are fairly confident, 29% are confident, and 12% are very confident. Cool. Okay. So yeah, as Giles said, we're going to move into a couple of case studies just to talk about some of the challenges that we've had, especially recently. With everything that's gone on with COVID, all our intensivists, have, or all of our anaesthetists have been intensivists. Theatres have been used for various different patients and different aspects. And um, we've not necessarily always had the availability of theatres to stabilise patients we would want to stabilise. Um, first uh, case study, we had a 93-year-old lady who was admitted as a trauma patient, had a fall, um, C1-2 fracture with cord contusions. She presented as a central cord syndrome, so her upper limbs more affected than her lower limbs. Um, largely fit and healthy though, one of those patients where you describe as a good 93 year old, previously fully independent. So it's slightly up, altered sensation in upper limbs more than lower limbs. Uh, strength were grossly intact, classified 
uh, as an Asia D on the spine injuries assessment. Um, so we sort of had um, three options that we were thinking about with this lady. Um, primarily surgical fixation, um, which given a 93 year old and all the other factors wasn't wasn't really the ideal option for the, for this lady and the consultants were very reluctant to and the anaesthetists were very reluctant to. Um, obviously this type of fracture with a um, with a much younger person the consultants would have been very keen to surgically fix a halo um, so screws into your head and then a brace around your trunk to completely immobilize your c-spine um, or to try and go more conservatively with a collar. Again we find certainly in our trust halos we're, um, we're quite loath to use them with the older patient group just because of the weight of them is significant and it significantly impairs people's function and it really, really sort of limits their um, mobility and all sorts of aspects of personal care and things like that further down the line, um, certainly for the months that they can be wearing them. And we've, uh, when it has been done, the functional outcomes in terms of trying to get someone discharged and the deconditioning that they've had in the process has been quite significant. Um, so this lady was treated a little bit with traction um, from the consultant early on because and her peg position did improve on x-ray with this traction. She, I didn't mention, but she had a type 2 to 3 fracture of the odontoid with posterior displacement and angulation, causing probable cord compression, but no atlanta axial subluxation. So that was sort of on the scan. So as I said, we provided, or well, I said we, the consultant provided the slight traction, and we fitted a collar in a flexed position to accommodate her posture. And she had to come in quite extended, but looking at sort of her body shape, she was clearly sort of, at these days, a little bit more flexed. The plan was then to mobilise and complete regular asia assessments because she was a central cord patient and we wanted to be hot on identifying any changes in neurology. Um, so we, may, we got her up, we mobilised her and we noticed increasing paresthesia through all four limbs. Um, and the consultant's notes, actually when I was going back through this, the consultant's notes were brilliant because they were really, really clear for me and his hypothesis was that as we were getting up and mobilizing, the C2 fracture was drifting as she was up and it was just starting to impinge on the cord. So this lady was taken to the spinal MDT and we revisited our, revisited our options. So think about surgical fixation. Again, not ideal in a 93 year old with multiple risk factors and in the current environment. Halo, we still remained really reluctant um, given all of the other aspects. Um, and then, or do we trial different braces, but bearing in mind the collar we've tried hasn't sort of offered us the stability we would want. And looking out there, nearly all collars you can get offer similar levels of stability. And C1 to 2 fractures are usually just outside their range. So we were stuck between a little bit of a rock and a half place there. Um, and this is where I get to Giles. Mm -hmm. So I'm just launch another poll. Um, so what treatment methodology would you suggest for this patient at this stage? So uh, would you be pushing for surgical involvement? Um, would you be looking to make modifications to, to the collar, go for a Miami J collar, halo traction, um, or perhaps, uh, perhaps a JTO, a cervical thoracic orthosis? Um, so people taking a little bit of time to decide on this one. So I'll leave that up for another another few seconds. Sorry, we took quite a while to decide as well in the MDT. <laughs> so we're at about 65%. And then I will end it there. So we're beyond the third. And we'll share that. Um, so 11% said surgery. 30% said Miami J collar. 17% uh, uh, said uh, resolve halo traction. Um, and 42% said a cervical thoracic orthosis, such as the JTO. Cool. So, you have the answer. Um, so, yeah, we went with uh, JTO. So, can we take the poll down, Giles? Yes, I believe it should have gone. There we go. Oh, Sorry. <laughs> it was on my screen, I don't know if it was on everyone else. Apologies, yeah, I hadn't clicked the button. <laughs> so yeah, so obviously theatre remained a very reluctant option. Halo still had multiple challenges with it. And so we went with uh, Miami JTO and then we mobilised again with uh, doing regular ages and we had no paresthesia and we had no further deterioration in neurology. So 
our answer there was to look at uh, MyMJ Select in bed, because we're obviously uh, MyMJ with, with extension in bed can be quite an uncomfortable thing and quite unpleasant for most patients. So for any patient group, we usually try and just have a MyMJ in bed and an extension when people are mobilizing. So we had her in bed with three pillows and a collar for, to accommodate her flexion in her usual position and an extension for mobilizing, which gave us the form of stability that we would really like. And I was discussing with Giles um, earlier today, actually, in terms of we know the extension that goes down to T2, but theoretically offers no further extension to C1 to C2. So I was going to throw that to Giles as to why that might have helped us. Um, so I, I think there's a, a variety of things that, that can be factors in this. So um, we were discussing about potentially immobilizing a, a larger segment um, can be helpful. There can be an element of some of the load uh, can be taken um, through through increasing support. Um, but generally, uh, you mentioned before, there's a little bit further extended. So it could be that perhaps that's preventing that, that shift as mentioned by the, the consultant. So it's important to look at different options options and different measures uh, and ways, as you said, to, to modify them in order to get the outcome uh, that you need. Yeah. And I think that sort of, we're, however it worked, it was incredibly effective for us, but it highlights one other aspect for me is the importance of us as therapists doing our neuro assessments and making sure we're identifying any changes. And that's some really strong objective information we can take to a consultant and say, look, actually, these dermatomes, these myotomes, whatever we're looking at, this is changing. So do you want me to continue? Is this our only option? Or do we need to sit back and reconsider? And it gave us that opportunity to regroup, reconsider, and get this lady sort of into a stable position, into a stable brace, without sort of any worsening neurology, which was our primary concern. So case study two is just thinking about a 56-year-old reefer who, admitted, who was admitted after a fall from a roof and um, had a T12 and L1 fracture. Although the notes had a T12 and L11 fracture, which was always interesting. Um, so he was um, admitted straight to us and no cord impingement noted. Uh, and I have just misplaced my records on his MRI, so I'll see if I can find them. No, but he so he had a T12 and L1 fracture, no other injuries, um, and we can see sort of where the fracture is, and we can see where sort of we we'd have concerns. So we were thinking, what are our options with this guy? And his age scoring was normal, um, so we had no issue, and we had an early plan to mobilise him with a TLSO and um, go from there which is what we would probably do with any standard patient from here. On getting this gentleman up, on mobilizing him, we again had further deterioration neurology, um, both sensory and motor. So from that perspective, we had um, concerns, obviously, so we took them to a uh, consultant. Again, objective sort of Asia information um, is gonna be really clear, and that's the really telling point if I can go with objective information as opposed to just hearsay. And that again, this patient again was taken to um, theatres and fixed. And then we mobilised him without a brace post-op and discharged him straight home within a couple of days. So while conservative options can work, it can be really effective. It's just ensuring as therapists, we are really hot on monitoring what is happening with their neurology um, to minimise sort of any further secondary complications and going from there. Um, um Ollie, um, just because we're, we're running quite uh, sort of long in terms of time, yeah. is it possible we could cover a, a few of the questions and, and perhaps if, if we can maybe come back to the last case study? Yeah, I just, absolutely. We're, um, so there's, there's quite, a few, uh, quite a few questions um, just with regards to um, the, who fits the braces and who deems them competent uh, within, your, within your trust. So uh, can you discuss a little bit around uh, that sort of process that you have within, uh, within your trust? So as therapists, we, fit, we have a stock set of braces that we fit um, and it's the neuroscientist therapy team or the trauma and orthopedic therapy team that will fit the majority of braces. 
um, and we sort of have a, have a competence thing of we will um, we'll do regular training. So also have come in and done training with us beforehand on collars and we'll get our orthotists up to do some training if we're unfamiliar with the braces. And then off the back of that, sort of I as a therapy team lead on neurosciences will work with my, with my team to check their competence and to, make, and to troubleshoot any issues and then um, go from there. So braces are fitted by um, all neurosciences and therapy um, and trauma and orthopedic therapists and anything non-standard is fitted by orthotics. Collars are fitted um, by a wider group because we have a lot of nurses trained up on fitting collars because we have a lot of patients come through who need their C-spine um, immobilizing in the early stages. So resource practitioners, so a lot of our charge nurses in trauma or speak to neuro. Okay, it's certainly, it's certainly an interesting thing. Uh, as an orthotist, I, I see lots of different hospitals with lots of different uh, involvements uh, with collars and there's massive regional variations, uh, whether it's orthotics involved, um, whether it's other AHP. So it's a, it's a really interesting subject that we get asked about a lot. Okay, well, thank you very much, Ollie. Um, that was really, really great. Um, and uh, we, will, we have still got a few questions, so we may come back to those at the end. Um, we're just going to cover a little bit about the Miami J. So I'm just going to go over um, and just show you uh, a few little bits on that. So we'll pop back to you in a, in a moment, Ollie. Um, so um, with regards to the, the Miami, Miami J Select, um, cervical collar is again, as we mentioned, controlling between C2 to C5. Um, and the first thing you notice is the, the, the blue parts uh, on here. And effectively, this is blue is you. So this is basically where the patient interacts with the collar. So the blue sections are where the patient uh, is actually in contact with them. And you'll notice there's different touch points on these. So for example, the straps on the posterior section, and then also this sternal adjustment here. So what this is for is to make adjustments to the rigidity of this sternal section. So if you can see that in the upper position, it's a bit more rigid, and in the rotated position like that, there is a degree uh, more flexibility, um, and this can be particularly useful if the patient's eating, for example, um, and it just means that you have the ability to adjust uh, the rigidity of that. Um, you also notice the liners, um, so these uh, are Sorbitex liners, they're both antibacterial and uh, breathable as well, um, so it just means that you're promoting a really good environment uh, in there, and you'll notice that the, the different ventilation in those um, helps contribute to, to maintaining the the dryness and the quality of the skin in there. Um, there's also uh, the ability to adjust the height uh, of the collar itself. So can you see I'm pushing this button here and I can then raise the collar up or down and you can just about see that we've got these lines across here. Um, so this is, uh, it just means that you can mark uh, exactly where uh, this is positioned. And interestingly, Ollie mentioned in one of his case studies um, that, that they were actually able to, to adjust this uh, slightly off center. So it is actually possible to have different sides in different positions using this collar. So if they're in an asymmetric position, perhaps with torticollis or something along those lines, you have an, an option to consider uh, for positioning that. I believe the, the one you mentioned before, Ollie, was a patient with a, a laceration on the, on the ear uh, from what you said. Um, so height adjustable there. It locks in position automatically, um, but then as we, we flip it over, there's a unique feature within this. Um, so you can just literally flip this lever uh, to the left as you face the collar, and this completely locks this here. So once we flip that over, it won't actually uh, undo. Um, and if you've got a patient that's particularly non-compliant, you can actually uh, remove that section there. So if you just snip that little lever off, um, you can remove that. But it's a really good way um, of maintaining compliance and making sure that that's uh, fitted uh, correctly and maintained in the position that you set it up. Going over to the back section, um, you can see again here, it mentions back, and then there's two little up arrows uh, either side. It's always really obvious to mention that, but you will see collars that are occasionally fitted the wrong way around and that sort of thing. So just be aware of those. 
Um, you'll also see that with the liners, in the case of the back section, um, the, the liners actually, the straps loop through the liners. So if you're ever replacing those, um, just be aware that you can pop those through. And then the last thing to note is that we've got flexible edging on these. Um, so this flex edge just allows the collar to contour to fit the shape of the, the patient's anatomy. Um, and it just means that you can get a really good intimate fit uh, from the posterior section of the collar. Now, if you order the collar, uh, as a, on its own, you get the, the collar both the front and the back, but always uh, good to mention is that there are replacement liners uh, for all these. So uh, always a really good component, an important component um, in maintaining good skincare, as Ollie mentioned before. Um, and then probably the last thing uh, to mention is there are these um, fit tabs that allow you to, uh, to check the fit, uh, sorry, not check the fit, to set up the fit um, so that the patient can reproduce uh, the setup of those. So it's an interesting uh, option. Um, so what I'm going to do is just go over uh, to actually fit the collar um, on the mannequin over here. Um, so we're just going to pop to the uh, top down camera and then we'll actually fit uh, this as we go through. Um, so um, also notice we have this very fancy uh, 3D printed mannequin thanks to uh, Chris Green Orthotics for this uh, for, for making these for us. Um, so the first thing, obviously it's really important that we're maintaining uh, correct spinal protocols. So there will normally be um, someone at the head end uh, supporting the head. So do bear that in mind. Obviously with uh, uh, social distancing, we can't do that here now. Um, so what we're doing is applying the back section of the collar first of all. So we're pushing down into the supporting surface and then sliding the collar underneath. I'm having to support his neck a little bit um, just because he's quite lightweight. Um, so we slid the collar into position, making sure that we've got it symmetrically uh, set up. So you can see we've got equal amounts of collar either side. Also be aware of the positioning. So if we look from the side again, uh, we want to make sure that we've got this position correctly. So what I effectively do is think about the tip of the occiput and we want the, the, the lateral edges of the collar um, to be positioned around that area. So conforming well uh, to the patient's anatomy. So we're now going to go on to, to fitting the front. Um, so in this case, uh, we're going to adjust this to size. So you can see there's a handy little tab here and we're just adjusting this to, to get it into the correct position. Um, so I'm just going to place that in position, test fit that, and then adjust accordingly to get it positioned correctly. Um, so what we want is we're aiming for this white section of the, the collar to be level with the tip of the chin. So you can see we've got that position correctly. And then we're just initially fastening these straps. Now notice I haven't got them fully tight on the first go. Remember you've got someone stabilizing uh, the head and neck in order to maintain that, that positioning. And then what we would do once we've got those fastened is it means that your hands are free and you're actually able to undo it on one side at a time and then as I'm doing this, I'm sliding the collar section up to make sure that we're getting really good contouring on the lateral jawline. And then exactly the same on the other side, difficult for you to see from here, but we're sliding that up and gradually revisiting each side in order to make sure that we got these tabs roughly equal. So I'm just gonna adjust that one, go a touch tighter on that side to get it positioned correctly. So you can see here, um, if we look from the top, that we've got really good uh, positioning of these and we've got equal tabs either side uh, and really good positioning. So another good important area to look at are the lateral sides, um, just to make sure um, that you haven't got it too loose. Um, so if you're looking from the lateral sides and you see, for example, that you've got a gap and you can see it looks a little bit wider on this side, that's often a really good sign that you haven't got it tight enough. And we can again, just revisit that side, adjust it, and bring it into position. Now, one of the reasons that we're, we're adjusting these sides, again, to get really good shaping to fit the, the jawline, but also we're making sure that we've got a really good bridge from the sternal pad all the way along this lateral line to make sure that we're not applying pressure on any of the collarbones to avoid any potential um, uh, clavicle issues, okay? Um, so, 
Um, what we're going to do now is I'm just going to flip this over and just highlight the, the other side. Um, so you can see got it positioned nice and central. Uh, everything's in position. Again, you can see all of the, uh, the, the straps, uh, sorry, the padding in position. So we're good to go. Good to go. Obviously, we wouldn't roll the patient over like that, but it's just good for illustrating uh, in this instance. OK, um, so uh, what we're going to do now is just quickly go over uh, to the TLSO. We'll just quickly uh, go through that. And we haven't got a huge amount of time, um, but we'll just quickly go through the, the Miami TLSO. Um, so you can see a variety of different uh, parts to this. So I'm going to move a few of these to the side. And you can see here we have the anterior thoracic extension. Um, so this is the Miami, uh, Miami TLSO. Um, and you can see anterior thoracic extensions, a variety of different adjustments that we've got on here. And for the adjusting the anterior thoracic extension, we have an Allen key here that allows us to undo this section. And this then means that we can adjust this setup here um, in order to contour it to fit the shape of the patient uh, as we're, we're, we're fitting it to them. We also can extend this to accommodate whatever position we need. And you can see that there's a, a button here and this will then lock um, into position. Um, and we then have adjustable pectoral pads either side uh, just to make sure that these are uh, gonna conform and fit the shape of the patient. Moving over to the, the posterior thoracic extension, um, we have the PT and the panel as well. Um, and you'll see in this case that, that we've got a belt uh, attached to this. Um, and the belt actually has a cinching system built into the posterior panel. So underneath here, we have uh, this cinching system. As we pull these two handles, this will tighten up as we'll show you uh, in a moment. Um, and in order to get that fastened and held in position. Exactly the same as with the Miami J Select, you'll see anything that's blue are effectively the touch points uh, for the patient. Um, so the blue section should be against the patient and you can see, for example, the clips have blue, blue touch points on them. So it's very simple to highlight to the patient uh, what bits they need to interact with it. Um, a couple of other things, um, you can actually add an extension to the anterior thoracic extension if you need to make that longer. There is also uh, different anchors, uh, so these are strap anchors in order to go for different types of configurations and I'll cover those in a minute. And then as a possible option, we also have a fitting tool here as well. You don't need it, um, but it's just a useful thing in order to apply it. Um, so what I'm going to do now is just quickly uh, go over to the to the treatment catch um, and then I'm going to fit this on Stuart um, so it's going to go over to him for a moment because I need to put on a considerable amount of PPE uh, so uh, and we'll then take it from there okay so a lovely view of Stuart there on the treatment couch is a much more compliant patient than the, the, the previous one uh, I'm just popping all of this kit on over the top. Okay, so when we now come to fitting the TLSO, of landmarks we just need to, to be aware of. So when looking at the anterior section, um, what we're wanting to do is make sure that we've got the posterior section positioned correctly. And there are a few landmarks that we just need to be aware of with this. Um, so first of all, effectively inguinal crease. Um, so we wouldn't normally do this on a patient, but it's a good way to highlight it. If you were to flex your thigh, Stuart, you can see that effectively when the patient sat, we want this section to be sat on the top of a flexed thigh like that. So the last thing we would want is for this to be positioned too low, and then the whole thing would shift up um, into position, uh, sorry, out of position. We can then adjust this accordingly, uh, according to the height, uh, to whatever we need. So I'm using that push button system in order to adjust it. And we're then uh, using our Allen key, um, and contouring this to fit the shape of the patient. So in this case, I'm just adjusting that very slightly to bring that into position and tightening that up so that it remains uh, in the alignment that I've set. 
Okay, so good to go. You can see positioned nice and centrally on the pectoral muscles um, and staying in position there. Okay, so we've set up our anterior thoracic extension. And then what we're going to then do is set up the, the PTE. So we've sized this according to a waist circumference. So we take a waist circumference here, and this then gives us the size of the panel. Um, and then what we would then need to do is log all the patient according to correct protocol. So in this case, um, Stuart's going to log roll towards me. Brilliant. And what I would normally be is on the opposite side. So obviously I can't stand over this side. Um, so if we swap uh, to that lateral camera, I'm on the wrong side so that I can actually show you the positioning of the brace. So what we're actually doing is sliding this into position. Uh, and we want to just make sure it's just a little bit out of shot, but effectively the bottom section of the brace should be positioned at the apex of the gluteal muscles there and we're just sliding this section through into position and position correctly. Okay, now one thing that's really important uh, for the patient uh, to make sure that we've got this position correctly. So with the clinician stood at the front here, they're applying a degree of downward pressure in order so that as we log roll them back, it's staying in a central position. So it's really important this doesn't get pushed laterally uh, by pressure from the, 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 the mattress or whatever from underneath, okay? So we're pushing down in the supporting surface and the patient's log rolling through and into position. So we've got that positioned and again, nice and symmetrical either side. Patient doesn't normally help you. So thank you, Stuart. Um, and we can then set up uh, the posterior thoracic extension. So this is where our fitting tool comes in and this slides either side onto here. And it actually means that we can set up the TLSO without need for trimming it. Um, if you don't want to, you don't actually have to trim these. Um, obviously, if you want the most low profile fit, you would then do that as well. But we can actually use this fitting tool either side, tighten this up, and then get it into position there. So we've positioned these. So by using the fitting tool, it means that we've got this gap at the front and it can be set up um, in order to apply uh, the, the ends of the belt. Okay, um, so these either side, I'm just gonna place one of those on your chest there, Stuart, and we're gonna fasten those either side like that place that through and it's then in the correct position. Exactly the same on the other side, place that over. And if you've trimmed that end, it means it covers that, that cut end, not a problem. Um, and then we can then position the anterior thoracic extension. So place that into position, open up these two Velcro sections. And this is a really good uh, way of actually anchoring this into, into position. So once we set this up, it will stay in position, both because of the Velcro pad that's underneath here, but because of these extra tabs across the front. So position nice and centrally. We've got everything uh, positioned correctly. We then use the the hand pocket across here. Um, and do bear in mind, dependent on the size and shape of your patient, if for example, they are particularly pear shaped, so they're wider at the hips rather than at the waist, you can actually angle the panels slightly differently um, in order to conform that. But obviously with Stuart's shape, we're positioned pretty much correctly here. And we can then go on to tighten these either side. So we have two handles here. One either side, again, with blue touch points. You can give these to the patient if you want to. And they're pulling these out laterally, perfectly, like that. And then into position. And dependent on what you need to, you can actually reduce the length of these. So I'll show you how to do that. So open this up. You can then take this spool out and then either lengthen or shorten these dependent on what you need. Okay. Fasten that one into position, we're good to go. Okay, and then at the, the top, we can actually bring these straps around. This one is a little bit short. Thank you, Stuart. You're much more helpful than you should be, apologies. Brilliant. Um, and we're then gonna tighten these and then fasten, fasten them into position uh, just like that. So this one's a little bit tight at the back. I'm just gonna adjust that one bring it into position, we're then good to go. 
Okay. Fasten this one. It's a little shorter than it should be. I adjusted it earlier. Brilliant. Uh, and then bring it into position. I'm going to lift this one up. Okay. And then got it. The Velcro is very strong on these. There we go. Fasten it into position. And we're then good to go. So we've got really good positioning. You'll notice nice and central here. Um, and you can see from a landmark perspective, we've got it nice and low at the bottom. Everything's positioned nice and centrally. We can adjust these shoulder straps if required. Um, and what we're going to do now is just go over to the, to the other area, to the fitting camera. Um, and we're just going to um, go through a few different adaptions that you can do to these, uh, dependent on what you need. So. Okay, so uh, Stuart's just going to pop over um, and you can see uh, we'll just make some adjustments if required. So this is the standard over the shoulder design. So if you can just face the, face the camera. So you can see we've got these uh, set up so they're fitting over the shoulder here like that. Um, and if you turn to one side, you can see it's set up with it just at the apex uh, of the bottom there. Um, but what we can actually do is set these up with different strap configurations dependent on what we need. So if, for example, we want to change from over the shoulder design, uh, what we can actually do, if you turn to face the front, Stuart, I won't remove these for now. I'll come back to those. Um, but what we can actually do we wouldn't normally do this stood up, but it's just so that we can illustrate it for you. Um, but the braces actually come with a strap anchor. So we can take this same strap, remove it from that section, place the strap anchor on the lateral side. So I'll place this one in position and then show you on the other side in a moment. Clip this one into position. And it basically means um, that you can actually adjust this to be um, using these pectoral uh, axilla straps rather than actually having the over the shoulder design. So if we then turn around, if you face me, Stuart, we're going to clip this one into position, bring these round and then fasten it like that and then tighten either side to get it in position. Okay, let me turn to face the front. Okay, so position nice and centrally. If we then need to extend the control further, you can order an extra set of straps. I've left the ones on from before. Um, and you can actually connect these at the top. So in order to do that, you just need to have an extra connection which clips into here and you can then have a combination of the two. So I'm not going to do that one now because we're a little bit out of time. Um, but it then means that you can have both over the shoulder design uh, and an axilla strap as well. So combining the two. Okay. Um, so that concludes the, the, the fitting for today. I'm just going to go and check uh, if there are any other, any, any other questions. So I'll go and check from there. I'll be back in a second. Okay. So remove my, uh, remove my PPE now. Um, so are there any further questions that anyone has for either Ollie uh, or myself? Um, Certainly, Ollie, um, there was a question about metastatic cord compression and your sort of thoughts about the role of bracing in those sorts of uh, situations. Um, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, we, we certainly will brace quite a lot in metastatic cord patients. But again, I think that's a group where we are very clear in making sure we um, assess our neurology and in the early stages and then we go from there. So we obviously again will do some sort of really clear neuro assessments and we are happy we're more than happy to brace in that group if the consultants and the neuro sort of surgical decision making is going that way um but it is based upon sort of like the neuro exam and that's where we feed back quite a lot to the consultants because if we start to mobilize people and then the neurology starts to change and um, we need to make some very sort of clear decision making on what what's our next plan because if we don't, um, or if we let some of the neurology deteriorate further, um, then we need to start thinking re realistically about prognostically what are we looking at 
uh, discharge planning, whether we're looking at quality of life for the patient and all sorts of those other aspects. So I think it is a cohort I'll, I'll brace, but it's a cohort where we have a lot of discussions with. Okay, yeah, certainly it is a, a, an evolving and difficult uh, patient group to deal with. So yeah, it, it does come up a lot. Um, there's also another question uh, from, from Steve Hunt, um, just with regards to when you would use uh, axilla and shoulder straps. And I think for, for me, um, that's really about how much immobilization you need. Um, so if you can imagine uh, having both axilla straps with the over the shoulder, over the shoulder strap design does mean that you're getting a much higher level of uh, mobilization I think uh, you you can use this from two different perspectives really whether you're wanting to you know you're needing that from a pathology perspective you're needing that very high level of uh, immobilization or also we have a lot of situations where um, thinking holistically about the patient there may be uh, patient groups where you need to employ high levels of support in order to uh, encourage compliance for example um, so those certainly been some of the feedback uh, that, that we've had regarding those. Um, so um, there's another question as well uh, just with regards to anterior thoracic extensions and uh, the suitableness uh, of those uh, in patients uh, for example if they had a mastectomy or sternal fractures is another situation where uh, you would uh, consider whether or not to use the anterior thoracic extension so there are different options available um, so we've just shown one of the uh, TLSO setups tonight um, but there is actually the the, the um, 456 setup the, of the Miami TLSO that basically has uh, axilla straps um, just on their own on their own similar to uh, a rucksack style of design um, so you can actually use that type of configuration in order to avoid uh, st sternal pressure um, a good example of that are for example osteoporotic patients who are in quite a kyphosed position you tend to find that if you're applying a high degree of pressure anteriorly they don't tend to be as tolerant to that as if you're using uh, shoulder straps and, and bringing them back uh, using those in order to get them in the correct uh, position. Okay, um, so we've gone a little bit over, uh, apologies about that, um, but um, what I wanted to do is just say thank you to Ollie, uh, really great talk, uh, you know, real depth uh, and, and real uh, interest uh, from that, so thank you very much for that. Ollie, really appreciate you taking the time uh, to, to do that. Yes. Um, and uh, what we'd like to do now is just uh, direct you to, to the webinar next week. Um, so in this case, uh, we will be uh, looking at dynamic bracing uh, for conservative management of ligament injuries. And we will be joined uh, by Mr. Yanis Pengast, uh, who will be discussing this with uh, one of his physio colleagues. Uh, it's a really interesting session where we talk about dynamic bracing and its evolving use uh, of this type of technology uh, within, within healthcare. So thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it's much better that we haven't had any power issues like we had last week, uh, but thank you for joining us and uh, we will see you next week.